This month's Where Did the Road Go is brought to you by three amazing people, Super Inframan, Allison Cook, and 36 Dingo. If you want to become a patron or a sponsor, go to wheredidtheroadgo.com. And now our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And tonight we have a supersized round table. We have, let's see if I can remember all of you, uh, Taylor. Hey. Super Inframan. Hello. Christopher Ernst. Hey, everybody. Red Pill Junkie. Feliz Navidad. <laughs> and AP Strange. Hi there. So, uh, yeah, this is, this is, I think six is probably the most we've ever had on a show. I can't remember how many we had on the last huge round table. It might've been mm-hmm. five, maybe six. I don't know. We almost had seven. Before. We almost had seven. Octavian was going to join us, but then he, he couldn't at the last minute. But uh, I, I think we have more than enough people here. Too mystical a number. <laughs> Wouldn't be able to deal with seven. Fair enough. Skype kicked you out already. It did, yeah. It yeah, kicked it's me out seven or, uh, sh- send me a bunch of runes and uh, uh, the place of the program. <laughs> yeah, that was weird. It, it was just ASCII code. All right. So, um, yeah, this is the, the year-end show. So if you're hearing this live on VBR, you're literally hearing it on the 31st of Jul- uh, July. Yeah, July. It's July now. Uh, I've, I've, I've mixed up the months and just thrown them into a mixer uh, or December, whichever you prefer. Uh, can happen. And patrons should also have this on the 31st going into the new year because um, that is Saturday, right? I got that right. Uh, yep. Sunday's yeah. the first. So uh, people on uh, regular feed won't get it till a week later, but this is our year end show. The last show recorded in uh, 2022. That's right. Right. We're not still in 2020. I think we're in 1995, right? 2020 part three. (laughs) There we go. 2020 part three. That feels right. Also 1995, like AKA 1995 also works. Yeah. (laughs) I think I'm still there. At least half of me is. (laughs) Uh, and so much stuff just cycles. So, um, Red Pill, you you were you were going over the Daily Grail stuff about stuff that happened this year, and the the one that struck me was uh, the Georgia Guidestones got blown up. Yeah, exactly. On July sixth, apparently, we're on July, early July. Yeah. So that, that that's just one of those things. Like, really, <laughs> not not something I ever would have expected somebody to do. Yeah, hmm. it was also comical the the reason it happened too, and like who who blew it up. I don't, I don't know if I knew who blew it up. Well, it was, as far as I remember, it was people who were, um, kind of on, on the far right and were, were blowing it up because of, um, they, they felt like it was a threat to Christianity. Um, yeah, exactly. And it was something that was provoked by a politician whose name escapes me. Yeah. She was running for governor, I think in Georgia. Right. Yes, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I did know uh, that. <laughs> yeah, they, it's weird that they haven't caught anybody, though. I mean, there's nobody specifically that they caught, and they had cameras all over the place. Uh, do you think they're really searching that hard? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, they're one of those things that I think outside of, you know, fringe communities, people weren't really that aware of until uh, that lady's political campaign brought it up. And then, of course... Uh, them actually getting demolished by the uh, explosion probably spread the material on the guidestones farther than they ever would have been had <laughs> nobody mentioned them. That's true. That's true. It's Something t- nobody knows about blows no. up. <laughs> yeah, how everyone knows. Thing, if people are interested, you know, at least for me, I really enjoyed. Uh, I don't know if you know for listeners, if anybody who listens to Conspiracy Normals familiar with uh, Doctor Future. Um, who's a yep. frequently a guest over there. Uh, but he, he, uh, and his real name, J. Michael Bennett, he was one of the directors of this documentary called, um, Dark Clouds Over Elberton, the true story of the Georgia Guidestones. And he has a really convincing argument for, and I'm totally forgetting the name of the guy, but who the guy was who actually was R.C. Christian, who funded and, you know, was behind the whole thing. And it turns out he is a, uh, 
sort of uh, Christian fundamentalist conservative uh, from somewhere in the Midwest, I think. I forget the name of the guy. You know, I can't I, remember either. The, the stuff that was written on the stones, for the most part, was pretty common sense for rebuilding a society. Yeah. And the fact that it was written in a bunch of different languages also kind of made sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's the interesting part. Yeah, I don't know. The whole the whole thing is really odd. And, and people took offense at the you know limit like population to a hundred thousand or whatever, and because I think they they felt like someone was saying, oh, we should reduce the population to a hundred thousand rather than just don't overpopulate if you know if if we get almost wiped out right and i think that was actually some of the rhetoric that got spread by the uh politician as well right um, right but you know and then the the builder from the documentary that chris brought up it's it's it really is a great documentary uh, there's some sort of bizarre rosicrucian connections in it too yeah that, like are. phone numbers to random places and things like that that were like really you know uh, yeah i i I'm sorry, I can't remember the details very well. But if anybody can, else, I think does. I think you can. I think actually think it's on archive.org. You can watch it. Like if you search for dark clouds over Elberton, it's out there. You can uh, uh, watch it. I thought yeah. it was on YouTube as well. Yeah. It might be on yeah. YouTube as well. That shows yes, you know. YouTube. It just shows you that I'm I'm old and weird because I'm like go to archive.org, <laughs> go to GeoCities <laughs> dot Tildy. Does GeoCity still exist? In my heart, it does. <laughs> uh, Probably. If you'd like to go to my Angel Fire website. <laughs> <laughs> Every once in a while, I'll, I'll have an older customer, and I'll be like, okay, what's your email? And they'll be whatever, whatever, at AOL.com. And I'm just like, really? Okay. Yep, they're still alive and kicking. <laughs> It's like, huh, AOL after all these years. I wonder if someday people will pay for emails with AOL extensions or something. The same way that uh, like two one two numbers get uh, get traded on the black market. <laughs> Maybe, um, obviously, as as any year, uh, a bunch of people died this year. Uh, uh, Red pill. You were you were listing off a few people right at the beginning of yeah, the year. There, prominent, na- very prominent names in ufology. Actually, you know, the yeah. first one, Betty, Andreas, and Luca. Uh, one of the most important uh, abductees. I don't know if I. Although I don't know if I, 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 we should categorize Betty as an abductee or more like a contactee. I don't know. I don't know what you guys think. I think experiencer is maybe just a, you know, a more generalized. Yeah, term. that's what I was going to say too. She's so sure. I'm actually, I'm actually not very familiar with uh, Betty Andreessen's story. Could, uh, it's could you wild one. Quick rundown. Uh, it starts in the 1970s. Well, actually, it started like many. I think it was the late six, like 67, I think. Yeah, you're right. I guess in 67, and and she, I only know that because of the Massachusetts connection. I remembered it because yeah. uh, how many times? Yeah, exactly. And, and and some entities somehow managed to enter her home without even opening the door. You know, like <laughs> it, like passing through the the solid. Uh, wooden door and all the people that were in the house with the exception of Betty uh, were like uh, frozen you know like mm-hmm. in suspended animation mm-hmm. or something and these entities one of the, them was the leader whose name was Wasaga asked <laughs> Betty to to come with them because the, 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 there was a very important mission that she needed to to uh, you know join so Betty joins them and they, they go into their craft and after preparing her, they go to this, I don't know if it was a planet or another realm or another dimension, another plane of existence where she saw all sorts of really w- uh, weird stuff, including uh, a vision of a giant bird like that was like a, some, something of a, you know, golden glowing eagle that is consumed in ashes like a like a phoenix of mythology and from the ashes uh there was like a a gray worm that erupted and after that uh, betty heard a voice that said you have seen you have heard do you understand something like that and she understood that it was kind of like the voice of god uh, God basically asking her to spread the message because it was important for the su- survival of humanity. And that's just the first of the recollected experiences that Betty managed mm-hmm. to, to remember through 
hypnotic, hypnotic regression. Okay. Uh, there are many other uh, tales uh, that she was involved in, in in other books that were written by, I want to say... Raymond Fowler. Raymond yeah, it was Fowler. Raymond Fowler she worked with. And I think that when she ended up working with Fowler, it was that she ended up having uh like recollection recollections going back to her childhood so you know yeah to again it opens so, up the yeah, sort of yes. the hypno the ho- hypnosis question but yeah she had all these um uh recalled all of these experiences going pretty far back and i want to say that she also was having obes like uh too oh, yeah. 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 The, yeah that's the thing that uh Betty's story is very, it has some of the tropes of classic abduction tales. You know, there are, there are medical procedures and she also witnessed uh, what seemed to be alien human hybrids that were harvested from women and then collected into some kind of like uh, uh, glass tanks mm-hmm. that were there, you know, for, for them to, you know, I guess, uh, leave and grow uh, and many other things but the other aspect of, of Betty Andreessen's story is uh, very mystical you know totally yeah. with a lot of and religious very, overtones yeah yeah, yeah. very, very Christianity based as well for mm-hmm. sure because she was uh, I mean she was Christian and also uh, I at one point I thought there was a very interesting connection between her story and the Shaker community that was uh, located in that part of Massachusetts where she lived. Uh, I don't think that people have explored that in depth because the Shaker women are also very uh, much used to receiving these kind of like messages from the beyond. Mm, interesting. You know? That's where the Shaker name comes from is, uh, uh, I believe, isn't it from the sort of the, the ecstatic experiences that they had have literally that their bodies would shake or am I completely making that up? Yeah. 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 They have these oh, like right. dances, yeah. you know, in yeah. which they let themselves go. And I think that's the name they, they've received yeah. because of that. Yeah. And I mean, the it, imagery of the Phoenix and sort of this, this gray worm erupting from the ashes and everything that, that seems very symbolic and almost alchemical i guess that's i don't know if that's the kind of angle that that sort of um, bleeds into some of that uh, mystical stuff but it's very interesting yeah it's almost a a reverse uh, butterfly kind of thing you know usually you have the the worm that cocoons and turns into a something that flies yeah got a a phoenix that burns and turns into a worm um which is and interesting also, yeah and also there's the apocalyptic overtones the idea that well yeah, yeah maybe our civilization will collapse and from the ashes of our civilization a, a new world will, will emerge do do we know uh when she started talking about uh human hybrids and things like that um uh, i think that's in the second book phase two yeah okay. if you if you get the book uh the watchers that kind of goes into like everything he kind of recaps everything yeah. ray, Fowl- ray fowler does he kind of recaps it all uh, more succinctly. Okay. Uh, and then interestingly enough, Fowler started remembering a lot of stuff that happened to him as well. Yeah, uh, exactly. So, he, so okay. he himself came out as an up, up to team. Now, but, yeah, th- th- through Betty's experiences, it's almost like he was able to really remember and experience his own. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, yeah. 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 Am I, am I wrong in saying that Fowler was also a spook at one point? I think you are wrong. With that. Okay. All right. Who's the one that did <laughs> Betty and Barney Hill? Sprinkle? No, no, no. Who, did, no? who wrote the book? Oh, oh. Fuller? Interrupted Fuller. Journey. Yeah. yeah. So the same guy? No. No. No, no. F- Fuller, not Fowler. Oh, okay. F U L L E R, I think. Okay. Yeah. All right. Versus that's F O W. That's what I was that's yeah. what I was mixing yeah. up. Okay. All right. So the reason I was mentioning the uh hybrids, I was just trying to think about like the timing and when that sort of became a a, a recurring element of abduction experiences or experiencers and it seems like that's probably on the early end of that. That, but uh, I don't know. Well, I think it's implied in the V.S. Boas case as well. Oh, okay. Well, so that's probably the earliest. But yeah, <laughs> I um, mean, our friend Joshua Cochin, you know, with his book *Things in the Night*, will argue that it goes back all the way back to um, the, the Celtic fairy faith. Oh, that's true. Sure. That's true. You know, the changelings. Well, yeah, but I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna do that, you could say it goes back to Greek mythology as well. 
Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah I mean. <laughs> Zeus would go pretty out of his way to impregnate earth women. So, uh, <laughs> but it, it, interestingly, that's, that's kind of where Fowler goes with some of, uh, Betty's messaging is that he, he titles the book, the watchers, because he equates it with like the biblical themes of fallen angels. Um, mm-hmm. and, you know, like Enochian angels and things like that, that are, uh, I- I- interbreeding with humankind back then. The Grigori were the, that was the watchers, the Grigori. Am yes, I saying that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's the name. Yeah. Yeah. So that's an interesting book. I got to say it really freaked me out. It is. It is. It totally and, uh, is. Fowler's an interesting guy. I feel like somebody ought to interview him because he's like still around and still writing. So <laughs> yeah, he wrote a book of fiction. I think last time. Um, yeah, but he released a book this year. I, uh, t- yes. It's called Time Slip Connections. Yeah. So I got a copy of it, but haven't haven't dug into it yet. But. Really? Mm-hmm. Yep. And what's, but what's, yeah, he wasn't a spook. He was a school teacher. I okay. Believe. All right. Yeah, yeah, I was mixing him up with the guy who did uh, Betty of Artie Hill. Yeah. So what? What's the time slip book about? Uh, it's basically he's he's I, like I said, I haven't dug into it yet, but it's um it's basically one of those things where he's coming up with explanations for all various different kinds of phenomena based on the flexibility and malleability of time and reality. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, sounds pretty complicated, but. <laughs> He does also have like an astrophysics background. Like uh, I think he was a, a, an astronomer, like a degree in astronomy or something like that. I believe so, that's true. Yeah. So okay. Um, Alta Dillard, Alta Dillard also passed away back in October. Not so well known, but uh, her and her husband Chad did like a three part show with me, I think, and put out one book. They were uh, pretty close with Mike Cleland as well. Mm. Oh. And uh, yeah, she passed away in October, unfortunately. Yeah. Their experiences were very interesting. The book, they were f- like the most interesting stuff that happened to them wasn't their UFO experience. Uh, and if you listen to the three part interview, I mean, all this odd stuff happened. And the people who did the book were like, no, 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 we just want the UFO part. Mm. And so, you know, they sent me the book and they're like, we're kind of disappointed because we couldn't tell the whole story. But that that is how this stuff works. They want everything, you know, packaged neatly for things that don't work that way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's all too common. I think um, like spare us the high strangeness because we just want things that we can easily categorize and, and put in one box. Right. Right. It's, right. it's, it's the MUFON uh, technique. True. Yeah. So what else is on, on that list there, Red Pill? Well, the other one, notorious uh, personality in ufology that also passed away was John Lear. Oh, oh yeah. passed away this year? Yeah. Yes. Huh. And what did John, yeah. John Lear do? John Lear is instrumental in disseminating all the wild UFO conspiracy theories that plague the field in the 1980s yeah. all the stuff about the dulce underground alien mm-hmm. base yeah. and all the nefarious experiments to create you know the, the hybrids and like a silent invasion that the, the grays and reptilians were doing to take over the planet all that became uh, the stuff of pop culture later with the X-Files and stuff. Yeah. Mainly because of uh, John Lear. Yep. Yeah. His appearances on Coast to Coast. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and, and, and if people want to learn more about that, there is no finer source than uh, Adam Goreitley's Saucers, Saucers spooks, and, and spooks and Cooks. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. I was just going to say that. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there's so many things. Like, I'm just trying to think of the stuff that he was involved in to list for people. If they're not, there was, uh, uh, like, Forrestal's Death, um, mm-hmm. uh, Majestic 12, that whole yep. trope, mm-hmm. Roswell, Aztec. Um, you have all you said, the Dulce based stuff. Yeah. What's mm-hmm. the name of this uh, document that he redacted with another person than Bill Cooper? Then claimed to have seen when he was still attached to the Navy and, yes. and, and John Lear said, Hey Bill, that we, we made that up. Right. Oh, what <laughs> was that? I'm now I'm thinking it wasn't the shape report. Was it? Cause no, that's the, was that was the Robert Bob, Bob O'Dean thing. A- I totally forget. I o- know Krill? exactly what you're talking about. O- yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, And Aaron Gullius did a, did a show on that. On, a wonderful uh, show. Yeah. yeah. Highly yeah. recommend it. Yeah. Well, he linked up with, uh, Bob Lazar a lot too, when they would go out and look at, uh, yeah, exactly. Bob Lazar and Elwood chumps. And then when John Lazar, 
Bob Lazar allegedly applied for a job at uh, uh, Area 51, uh, they asked him about uh, about his friends and, and he told them that he was friends with, with John Lear. And apparently that didn't hurt his chances of, you know, working with alleged uh, retrieved alien craft at S4. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess they say, oh, this guy is friends with this cookie that is spilling the beans <laughs> with all this nonsense about UFOs and alien threats and all that. Yeah, I'm sure it will be fine. <laughs> no, it'll, it'll be fine to continue the disinfo. Right. Exactly. Instrumental. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Was, was uh, John Lear, did he... I don't remember, and somebody might have just said it, but did he work for the CIA or? Yes, he did. Yeah. Okay, yeah, he was the 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 son of I don't remember the name the name of his dad. Learjet. Yeah, the guy yeah, who Bill? created the the, the Learjet. But uh, John got disowned because you know he was a he he had a passion for flying. You know, I think he broke his arm when he was I don't know in his teens. Mm. And and after that, he 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 uh, became a, a pilot for the CIA. You know, doing uh, spook jobs like Air America stuff in, oh. in Cambodia and Laos and all and all the things. Wow. Okay. I think it was Bill Lear, right? The uh, founder yes. of the Learjet. Bill Lear. Bill yeah, Lear. exactly. Okay. Yeah, and, and 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 that's a re one of the reasons why a lot of people approach John and to tell him to tell them their cookie uh, UFO stories because they had the impression that John, being the son of this uh, millionaire, was also full of money. But <laughs> no, sure, that wasn't the case at all. Yeah, as happens when you're disowned. <laughs> yeah, another another crazy story that uh, John disseminated was the idea that there's a. Uh, a machine on the moon that steals your soul once you die. Oh, of course, that machine. Yeah. Yeah, that machine. <laughs> I actually yeah. had not heard that one before. I hate it when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> so make sure when you die, it's during the day and the moon's on the other side of the planet. Yeah, yeah right. Don't follow the light, guys. That's the machine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, isn't 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 that kind of the Carlos Castaneda thing though? Don't follow the light because it's just going to devour you. Yeah, but that's the ego. <laughs> yeah, in, in Carlos's stuff. And I think Whitley had had some was wondering about that at one point too. That maybe going well, into the light wasn't the thing you should do. Yeah, he has this crazy idea, you know, that me that his friends, the visitors, uh, if you don't have a strong soul, they will consume it once you die. Mm, okay, is that what it was? Interesting. Mm -hmm. Did Streber do anything this year? Uh, he put out a book, book. Was that last year? It was last year, I think. Yeah. A New World. Yeah. A New World, yeah. I, I know uh, Linda Godfrey died. Yes. Um, actually, fairly ah, Linda Godfrey, yes, you're right. Yeah, she she's the author of uh, The Beast of Bray Road. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah that was sad. I mean, she's the, the reason we talk about Dogman. Right, yeah. Yeah. Although I must say I, I didn't agree with her theories that it was some kind of like uh, evolution of some kind of like canine. Mm. Sure. Right. Well, if you're going to stick with flesh and blood, I mean, that's how many paths do you really have to dog man? <laughs> that's, that's a good yeah. question. Especially yeah. considering the the substance of a lot of those stories. Yeah. Nobody goes with mad scientist anymore. I want more mad scientist. <laughs> you got to yeah. be the mad scientist, Chris. I know. I know. I should. But she did kind of explore some of the supernatural explanations as well, right? With like, yeah. like yeah, a so. de demon dog sort of idea. Or, uh, but uh, I also really like her illustrations in the books. Mm. She's she, she uh, did pretty cool illustrations. Mm. Oh, she did so, her own illustrations. Yeah, oh, I think cool. that's what she was doing for work was writing for and illustrating a newspaper prior to, and that's how she stumbled on the Beast of Bray Road story originally. Interesting, from what I understand. Yeah. Okay. If I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know a whole <laughs> lot about her, and I've never no, read any of right. her books, okay. so I. I don't have that much to, to comment on her about. Yeah. <clears throat> she, she, now, you're definitely right about the uh, journalistic part that she kind of happened upon the story, but I, I don't remember the art part, but that makes a lot of sense. So um, what, what else is on that uh, Daily Grail list there, Red Pill? Yeah, another, another personality that died is uh, Brazilian researcher A.J. Gebhardt. Not familiar uh, with him. I, yeah, I know that he's not familiar with people uh, – in the United States, but 
I mean, he was instrumental in disseminating UFO stories outside Brazil. You know, I guess if you if you ever heard of the Vargina case or the Vargina case, it's largely because of of him. You know, along with other other stuff. Were we supposed to get some new documents about that? <laughs> yeah, sure. Any any <laughs> any minute now. <laughs> and, and, and what was that case? Virginia case? Yeah. Uh, is the stuff of uh, James Fox's uh, new documentary, Moment of Contact, which I haven't uh, seen yet, and I, I don't... Is not really that in my priority list, but it's a it's a very prominent case that emerged in the I want to say in nineteen nineties, I think nineteen ninety six probably. Uh, three you know, girls were walking to their home in the state of Minas Gerais in Brazil, uh, and they saw what looked like some kind of like someone hunched. Uh, la- leaning on a on a uh, wall, uh, and and when they looked closer, they saw that this was some kind of like entity with brown skin, uh, a very prominent uh, enlarged head with some with three kind of like bumps on top of the head and large red eyes. So obviously the 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 the, the girls scream, they run away. And but apparently, according to the case, that's not the end of it, because there were other people who also saw a second uh, creature uh, around that place. And there are also uh, people connecting the dots saying that uh, other reports of uh, a UFO that supposedly crashed in, in the vicinity and the army got involved and they not only secured the beings but also the craft and one of the soldiers that uh, captured the being touched the, one of the creatures and died as a result of that uh it's a very convolu- convoluted and to be honest i don't put much talk in it i think that's something that has ballooned out of proportion although probably the original report uh is factual like the girls probably did see something whether right whether it was that's what was an anomalous entity or maybe something else that's you know that's for interpretation but then uh james fox conducted a lot of interviews in Brazil in the couple, in, in, in the last few years, and you know he released the do- the documentary Moment of Contact this year. I think it was in July or something like that uh, in, in the middle of the year. And so apparently, I don't know if he got more information, but uh, like AP said, uh, he promised that there was going to be more information that will validate the story, including a video of the creatures that was going to be released. Uh, obviously, it hasn't happened. I'm, I'm willing to bet that it will never happen. <laughs> yeah. Didn't Roger Lear write a book about this? I never read it, but Roger Lear, like the podiatrist guy? Probably. I don't know. You know, I mean, it's... I don't know if uh, anybody read that. But yes, it, uh, as far as the stories, uh, UFO stories from Brazil, the Virginia case... Along with Antonio Villas Boas, is probably one of the m- most famous cases yeah. outside of Brazil. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. And, and there's always that there's more to come, and then it never comes, and people still follow that carrot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was every the, damn time. That that was the whole to the stars thing. Just wait. Just wait a few months, and everything's going to change. And you know. Yeah. My go to my go to analogy for that is uh, Lucy Van Pelt putting the football out for Charlie Brown to kick. Yes. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but every time you know ufo twitter comes running to kick that football and <laughs> it just never never quite works out yeah, so, that's right uh it's kind of just kind of hilarious to watch it play out over and over again and uh it's not even not even fun to say i told you so anymore <laughs> no not really <laughs> Has it can, has it uh uh the the alien the phenomena uh at uh Bargenia also become sort of a cultural phenomena? I just remember looking at it like before I went and we did the uh <laughs> excuse me the film in um uh Visoko about the Bosnian pyramids in like the aughts. I remember looking at how the uh the city of uh Varginha had like like they have a water tower that's ufo related now and they like do it's like a lot of ufo tourist stuff 
I haven't been there, but I remember reading up on that, doing some research. It's interesting that like that that it's it has become a big part of the identity of the town now. I think in a positive way. Like Minas Gerais, I think is uh, a place that has always had uh, a lot of UFO activity and not always positive. Ah, okay. Like, m- like this is in the, the state of Belém, and this is where many of the stories of the Chupa Chups ah, from the nineteen yeah. seventies came from. The suckers, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah, the stories of the of these uh, refrigerator-sized objects that will shoot out uh, beams on people that will cause uh, burns and also uh, a loss of uh, white blood cells. And this is something that the, the, the Brazilian, Brazilian government, we know that they seriously studied with this uh, uh, project, Project Prato, Project uh, yep. Saucer. Uh, I think that the head of the of the of that project, you know, the, the, the I think he was a colonel, eventually committed suicide. It's uh, it's a very strange case, and and uh, uh, obviously civilians don't know the whole story. I, I guess the only civilian uh, that actually got to see a bit more about those files was. Uh, Jacques Vallée when he visited Brazil mm, okay. in the 1980s. Yeah, that's. Um, uh, I mean, I, I guess I didn't realize it was near enough to the where the uh, the the Chupa Chupas uh, had been, but that makes sense. I mean, it's interesting. I just find it interesting too that you do have sometimes these incidents, and I guess the same is true of Roswell, where it becomes culturally uh, this you know, really big thing. And then I start to think like, uh, I don't know, you've, you've said many times, Saxon, uh, the whole idea of the Bigfoot museum, you know, being like a shrine to Bigfoot type thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, you know, and you can go back to Roswell with that too. I mean, there's the museum in downtown and the, yeah. Sure. You know, their their chamber of commerce is based around that, but right. or Point Pleasant, yeah, or Point Pleasant, yeah, and uh, <laughs> you know the mythology grows and grows. Like tying back into John Lear, uh, when you've got um, oh my gosh, I'm trying to remember the name of the, the caverns in New Mexico. Um, that are, well, they're, they're like two hours south of Roswell, and so suddenly it's like, oh, you know, here's the deep underground bases. Oh, like the <laughs> act, they're actual caverns that are there. Yeah, yeah, it's the yeah, the yeah. largest big room uh, yeah. in the United States right. in, mm. uh, in New Mexico, and it's like six or seven football fields wide. Uh, I mean, it's a tremendous space. It's basically seven acres. Um, and so, you know, you start to put together like, okay, I can see how somebody, uh, if they wanted to make up a story would leverage this, uh, sure. plus you've got Roswell next door too. Right. Yeah. Well, there's all, all these, uh, lore, you know, even before the arrival of the Spaniards about, uh, you know, the ant people of the Navajo stories of the underground cities, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in caverns. Yeah. And, and I found that. Very, very interesting, you know, and not that I fully believe them, but you hear about that and you hear about other places where they believe there are you know, is these underground cities built by advanced civilizations like Shambhala, Agarty, you know, uh-huh. in Tibet. Uh, this idea when you connect it with what uh, Graham Hancock says in, in his series Ancient Ap- Apocalypse, which also happens to have been released this year you know it it is tantalizing to believe that yeah maybe someone knew that something was coming and in order to save themselves they 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 decided to go deep underground in Mm -hmm. order to create i don't know bunkers Mm -hmm. Uh, it is yeah it's it's very interesting because that's like mount shasta too right with the lumerians i mean the the mm-hmm. stories repeat, and of course, yeah. the more you invest in those stories, like although the the, the Lemurian thing and Mount Shasta, I think, is more about the I am activity, <laughs> right? Uh, but there are sex. other things like the whole, uh, you know, the what is it, the from Death Valley Men, uh, the Bork Lee book, the that that um, uh, fable about the Hav Masuvs in the Panamint Mountains and stuff like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh and the the uh the Lovelock Cave, you know, uh um, yeah. side. 
there too. So I mean, I think you're right, uh, uh, Saxon. It's yeah, the the the, the Shasta Lemurian thing is <laughs> is yeah, it's uh, oh, oh, it, it cracks me up because uh, you know you when you start putting belief into these places, whether or not these things happen or not, yeah. weird stuff is bound to happen, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, if you go uh, through the middle of uh, downtown in Mount Shasta, there's you know. Uh, I'm trying to remember the thing, the the names for it, but there were tour companies that would take you to liminal spaces on the mountain yeah. to like experience, yeah, like you know, the portals. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it's, yeah. oh, it's totally be Shasta's totally become a symbol for that, even if yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm 100. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, same with Sedona. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Um, I Energy need to go vortexes and stuff. Yeah, 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 exactly. yeah. Yeah, we have some of that here in Mexico. Here's a place called Tepoztlan in Morelos. Uh, that's the place where Louis Farrakhan uh, alleged, uh, allegedly had right. a, a close encounter. Yes, yes. That is in, very important in the nation of Islam, although obviously this is not something that is uh, very uh, popular. You know? Yep, yep. Yeah. The, the, the work or listen to the work of Stephen Finley, Dr. Stephen Finley. Interesting that's stuff true. about that. Yeah. You know, his book just came out, didn't it? Uh, I believe so, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. so I, I was trying to remember because I have the book. I couldn't remember who wrote it off the top of my head, and it's uh, it's very uh, a very well written and well thought out book. But it's so academic that uh, mm, it's and, super and academic. That is, yeah, it's it's hard to penetrate, and I don't mean that it is. In a bad way. I mean, yeah, he really did his work, yeah, and it takes a lot of. Uh, sociological things into uh context which yeah. you got to do with something like this yeah right? no i think that speaks that, to the audience of that kind of book that's right? exactly I mean, right he's very much in the academic sphere i mean he was you know cool enough to speak at conspiranormal conference uh, a, a couple of years ago but he's very much like he has to play by certain rules in order to get things done and you know he might not even think about it playing by rules this might just be his practice but yeah it's yeah. it is dense you're right that's the very fair assumption <laughs> or, or it's 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 uh, 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 very um, it is. Yeah, the academic, the language is academic and it can sound kind of, uh, you know, it can be kind of hard to crack. Yeah, you're going to do a couple intellectual push ups before you start yeah. doing heavy lifting oh. with that book. I, I don't mean to do <laughs> apologetics for I guess I have to do apologetics for academics because I got like one foot in there. But yeah, it's still <laughs> it's still good. But it is good. I mean, that, that's yeah. frust- yeah, it is total. That type of writing frustrates me, you know, to no end. Sometimes in many in many contexts too. Yeah, right. But I think uh, you make a very good point about you know it is very cool that he would come and speak you know at strange realities or or come on you know various podcasts and talk and you yeah. know that's a lot more accessible. People can can hear him sort of talk about the the stuff that he discovered or yeah. you know has been researching. Yeah. Totally right, right. Yeah, I think I first heard him on Radio Mysterioso, and that was that. That was an awesome chat between him and yes, Greg. Yeah. him and Greg mm-hmm. had a great cool. chat. Yeah, I didn't know he was on that uh, Radio Mysterioso too. I'll go look for that. Yeah. I, I just heard him on. This is uh, a while back. Yeah, Conspiracy Normal. Okay, probably yeah. two years ago or three, yeah. maybe. Yeah. yeah, two or three years ago. Yeah. Oh, you know, speaking of uh, Whitley and other podcasts, Jeremy Vaney is hosting uh, on Dreamland now. He is, yeah, he's, right. he's, yeah, yeah. He, yeah, yeah, he's the sub host. Yeah. yeah I, I thought that, that was kind of awesome. That is cool. Does he have a new book out or something? I have uh, Yes. He, he yeah. Does. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you just interviewed him, didn't you, sir? I, I did. I, I yeah. interviewed him for that, and then he came back on to do a show where we compared our Kundalini experiences because they're very different. Oh, interesting. That was a super yeah. cool show. The, uh, yeah, that was cool. The book is called... Oh man, it has a I've fun f- fun title. I can't remember it. Yeah, uh, and, and it's written in like the way Jeremy talks. Yeah, so, well, that's how he writes his books. Yeah, it's it's very conversational. It's, it's got his like amazing snark and sarcasm. I mean, it's it is self deprecation. Uh, yeah, entertaining uh, to to the the very you know nth degree, regardless isn't it, of isn't the topic. it the first and final disclosure. I think, I that's, think that's the that's secondary so. title. It's got see. like a header and then that's the secondary title, but that's the part I remember. I'm trying to look <laughs> it up, but I can't spell his name. V A V A E N I. I'm sure his ear his ears are burning right now. Right. You know. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, he took over doing that, I think, at the end of October. And he's uh, he still has the Our Undoing podcast too, right? Right, which yep. is uh, mostly old episodes of um, Paratopia with him and Jeff, mm-hmm. if I'm remembering right. Yes, yes. 
Yeah, that's where I found. Oh, here we go. Utopia stuff. Uh, you, you're right, Soraya. It is Aliens, the that's first it. and final disclosure. Oh yeah, I knew something was missing. And it and it's so <laughs> it's so <laughs> speaking to an audience who is going to hate it. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Well, the people that are going to hate it are the ones that need to hear it the most. Yeah, well, that, that was his argument. <laughs> yeah, maybe by next year, they'll be ready to listen to that message. Why next so, year? Uh, I don't know. Like another year in which they will not get disclosure. Mm. But it's yeah. just around the corner. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah. well, so, I don't know. Because, talk about uh, dangling carrots. One thing tricks. is interesting, and I, I, I was thinking about this in terms of end of year. Uh, I don't know. I know that you, Taylor, do some astrology. I don't know if the, some of the rest of you do. I, I don't, in, but in the sense that, uh, but I do follow people uh, you know, who talk about mundane astrology, which I find very interesting, which is, you know, astrology of the world. And um, uh, as some of you might know, there are a couple of shifts that are coming up that do very much have to do with uh, like technological and communication based uh, uh, leaps and advances. Uh, and usually the way that mundane astrology works is that, you know, it's a lot of looking at past world events when there were these certain conjunctions, uh, you know, or certain uh, patterns that were happening. And so we have some very strong ones coming up between now and like 2025, 20, 26, uh, and then furthermore that sort of resolve, not resolve, but go up into the mid 2030s that have to do with breakthroughs in technology and communications technology, um, which I found very interesting to, you know, hear many people in the mundane astrology world talking about. Not that that's going to be disclosure, but I do think it's sort of relevant uh, uh, in some ways to what we're talking about is that this is, this is another like, you know, silicon, uh, uh, like transistor type, um, uh, breakthrough type thing, like big mm. stuff, like quantum, fingers. quantum computing related or something. Yeah. Who, I mean, who, I don't know. I guess we could like take our pick at like what we think it could be. I think communication is the sort of the, the keyword. And that has particularly to do with maybe, you know, mercury in the mix. Yeah, I, probably. I'm the last person to, uh, yeah. Um, I, I'm not well, familiar I, with, with what you're talking about exactly but i would guess that's some kind of like conjunctions with mercury it is a conjunction Jupiter. yeah it's like i think it's con it's it's mercury you know Uran uranus and um okay. uh, uh maybe pluto i think if, uh again you're hearing the limits of what my, the astrology part of it i i'm interested in more from like a esoteric you know world events type thing but sure. i find mundane astrology to be very interesting so well you know one other thing that we're on the cusp of now is uh, uh nuclear fusion as opposed to fission that is something that just yeah you're very yeah. right china and then us yeah yeah you know we, i'm sorry we pluto pluto entering aquarius and then neptune entering aries i was completely wrong about oh, this and oh, so uh, no mercury. uranus entering gemini um yeah yeah that's what it was so no mercury yeah it's yeah. interesting that pluto is still included in astro astrology isn't well, it? I mean, well, it didn't used to be really. They didn't know it existed. Right, right, right. Same with Uranus and Neptune. Because they added it in later, you know. Uh, I didn't know that. That makes sense, though. Hmm. Yeah, the yeah, whole I mean, thing with Pluto and whether it's a planet or not, I, I don't, I don't think that it matters as much as like it, some of the conversations out there tend to make it seem like it matters. It doesn't matter in the sense of astrology. I don't. Right. Think because no, because you know, other any celestial body has some relevance. No, there yeah. there are still astrologers out there who don't use any of those three planets. Right, um, you that know, would in, be using like Vedic astrology or you know, yeah, uh, Hellenistic yeah. astrology maybe. I, yeah. That could be. I don't know off the top of my head. I mean, I yeah. personally find it hilarious that in the Pioneer uh, space probe, they send a plaque like showing uh, like instructions to how to get to Earth. Right to any right. Pot potential aliens that will discover the the, the artifact, yep. and in that plaque that is very symbolic, but they do show uh, the nine planets, you know, including Pluto. Mm -hmm. but now that Pluto is not a planet, I think the poor aliens are going to get lost. <laughs> yeah, they're, <laughs> they're, they're, oh, yeah, they're looking for they're looking for Planet X. Yes, <laughs> mm, that's a very interesting point. Not that that's a really easy map to follow, anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
star system with nine planets. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. Wait a minute. There's like 12 other like mini planets outside this thing. <laughs> What what counts as a planet? Maybe those are rings. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, communicating with an, a truly alien intelligence would be very, very difficult. Mm-hmm. You know, now you, you could, just got me Googling the, the Voyager records. I mean, you could say, well, mathematics could do it. Maybe, maybe. But, I mean, their understanding of mathematics may work differently. Their understanding of, of space and time may work differently. Mm. That's why it's got to be music, man. <laughs> bum, 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 bum. If they have yeah, but ears, mu- music depends on time. On true, tempo. true. It also I'd depends that, on yes. knowing what a record is and how you're going to play it. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Yeah. What you mean? Aliens don't have phonographs? Uh, well, they might. <laughs> they only, only, only the hipster aliens do. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone else on cassettes. You know, it's yeah. it's interesting because, like, when you think about it, all life is connected by, like, this continuous stream. Like, it started at one point on our planet. We're all connected to that first point because life doesn't just appear. So then mm-hmm. you have to wonder, are we also connected to life out there? Like, did life from here come from out there? And if not, what are the chances that it just spontaneously arises somewhere else? Because as far as we know, it's only happened once here. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't know. I guess I, I tend to speculate that maybe life here came from some kind of celestial collisions or something. Mm. Um, or, you yeah, know, but, like from spermia or something like that. Potentially from uh, Mars. I mean, scientists are now saying, and this is a recent uh, science news story that broke uh, this month. Science Scientists are now saying that probably life emerged first on Mars rather than on, than it, on Earth. It would make more sense for it to have come here from somewhere else than to have spontaneously generated here. But, you know, at, at the same time, like you're just pulling the thread back further, right? I mean, it's it's the same with anything. You, you get you get far back enough. Okay, you still haven't answered the question of where that came from exactly, right? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I'm not a, uh, I'm not a scientist. I always get very fascinated of the idea of, um, you know, life being engineered uh, on a planet and the idea of, okay, I'm going to plant this seed that is something like a single celled organism, but I've coded in all of this growth that's going to happen over time of, you know, replication of species existing, begatting other species and on and on and on. It's a, it's a neat idea, but it's one of those things that I, I'm, I don't know if I ever think is actually as possible as some people would like it to be in the sense of being like an outside force manipulating it over, you know, billions of years. Engineers from Prometheus. Yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I would think of it more like, I mean, you know, you mentioned seeds, right? We're talking like literal seeds in in some capacity, but that evokes the image in my head of like a seed in a a game that creates random worlds, like Minecraft, for instance. Uh, You you have this spark, but then everything that happens after that is all, it's based on that, but it's, you know, for, for all intents and purposes, random, you know, based on some kind of algorithm. So it changes based on whatever that's, that starting, you know, seed is. But so I guess what I'm saying is, do you think that it would that it would be something that's mm-hmm. so planned out from the beginning, or do you mm-hmm. think it's something that happened because of um, you know just causation and and evolution? I guess maybe a bit of both, Taylor, because you know I'm also fascinated by like fractals and how they repeat and mm-hmm. you, but you know it's an initial equation that's launched out there that turns into that, right? Um, and I, I actually sort of think life is a lot more tenacious than we give it credit for, which makes it stranger that we don't at least right now see other things necessarily. Um, because think of the cataclysms we've had on this planet and, you know, we shouldn't be the dominant species, um, you know, 65 million years ago, it was giant, uh, you know, dinosaurs and, uh, somehow, you know, life persevered despite all the changes that happened after the impact. So anyway, and that's happened more than once. If you look back at other giant cataclysms that have happened on the planet. But I think that says a little bit more about life being willing to change and adapt to thrive. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Tenacious is a good word for it. I mean, the basic algorithm for life is DNA, right? I mean, that's mm-hmm. the thing. That's the stuff that everything from fungi to sequoia trees to us is based on. And I find it fascinating. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to finish uh, the book DMT, The Spirit Molecule, how some of the volunteers 
in that uh, study, mm, they had this, yeah. I mean, many of them had visions of DNA type uh, spirals. Like that's kind of like one of the most common things that they had during these experiences. And one of the, those volunteers also had this idea that the best way to travel through the universe is not with metal spaceships, is with DNA, like sending DNA out through the cosmos, mm, you know, because, you know, for lifetime eventually is, you know, uh, unimportant. Yeah. You know, mi millions of years, billions of years, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much it, ta it takes for DNA to arrive from a planet to another and take root and start spreading into you know countless uh, new life forms yeah absolutely mm -hmm. just like the engineers from prometheus <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> i also wonder too from sort of a more um speculative mystical standpoint if you 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 know if you look at the if you look at creation as being something that is emerging from consciousness rather than consciousness emerging from physical matter mm -hmm. right. then I think it could follow that you would think that there are, you know, in these sort of underlying, uh, you know, interpenetrating spheres that are part of existence that we see glimpses of the other world, that if that somehow has something to do with consciousness, too, that there could be, you know, laws that are like our physical laws that we have here in the material world, you know, gross world, um, that these other laws, uh, you know, can sort of i don't want to say uh um, supersede physical laws but they cause things that to us seem anomalous but uh really are part of a natural system that we just don't understand uh part of the i don't want to use the word physics but the operations of these underlying systems that are not based on material and in that sense if life is then an extension of consciousness then some of these systems could be working in sort of mysterious and strange oblique ways that we don't quite understand along with things like panspermia and you know um well, well, uh, i guess uh, engineered dna or whatever other speculations we throw out there uh something i often think about too that like what if the systems aren't just physical that are perpetuating some of these things we talk about in terms of extraterrestrial life and panspermia and stuff like that I mean, getting back to the DMT uh, stuff and the DMT uh, trials that uh, Rick Strassman conducted in the 1990s, after the volunteers uh, go through the uh, the D like the DNA uh, helix stuff, they go to the logo stuff, you know, a realm that is f uh, full of symbols and and algorithms and numbers that they couldn't comprehend, but kind of like give that impression, Chris, that that there is some kind of like consciousness that first has to manifest mm -hmm. in sense of uh, ideas and words and numbers and yeah. rational expressions. And those expressions then take root into the material and yeah. self-organize in the form of uh, DNA and, and, and yeah. you know, molecules, yeah. self-assembling molecules, and you, then you get what you have. You have uh, machines that use those molecules for their purposes, and we call those cells. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and they're still connected Absolutely. to that, that aspect of consciousness, yeah. you know, yes. which makes something yeah. like using DMT or other, you know, other... Uh, plant medicines, I guess, for lack of a better word, to interface with whatever that is. That yeah, that's this, fascinating. This really goes. I mean, to me at least, it all, and it's probably has a lot to do with my upbringing. But this all very much seems to me uh, the same as these Vedic concepts of you know uh, the the three bodies and the three sort of worlds, where you have this mental seed body, which is they, it is referred to as a seed. And it is, or the the mental sphere, and then from that emerges the pranic sphere, which is the the sort of the energy to then create what is the material sphere. Um, uh, it, to me, it's at least if you look at sort of particularly the Ada Vedanta, you know, uh, that side of because I know Ve Vedic um, writings and Hinduism is a lot of stuff in there, but very particularly this sort of this is like the oldest 
oldest stuff that exists in Sanskrit, um, you know, uh, even sort of prior to the, the, the Krishna and Rama and stuff like that. And it's, um, it's, it's interesting. I mean, this, you know, I'm not the, that I'm, I'm certainly not the first person that's made this connection. There's plenty of stuff, you know, go on, I don't know, Graham Hancock site and you'll find a bunch of stuff about, you know, this, uh, Vedic science, but I find it very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I tend to think pretty much along the exact same lines as you described there. Um, and I think sometimes that the, they're the underlying invisible supports for the material reality that we have and that we can all agree exist and can experience together. Um, sometimes needs to shift to, to like a, um, accommodate something that has changed. Yeah, and th that's where we see anomalies. It's yeah. almost, it's almost like a, like a, um, now I'm forgetting the word that I wanted to use for it, but <laughs> <laughs> Retcon? Uh, it's d d there's like a displacement going on. So th there has to be, uh, there, there has to be some other non-material entropy? Uh, entropy. That's the word I was looking mm -hmm. for. Yeah. Uh, there's an entropy on a non-physical um, uh, support level of, of material reality. And that can, that can present in the material yeah. realm as, as something anomalous that you can't explain, mm -hmm. which can sometimes be much more Douglas Adams than HP Lovecraft. Um, <laughs> where, <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to picture this. Could you give an example? Um, it's hard to give exact examples, but I, I mean, yeah, I, I think of well, I mean, it's hard to because you end up getting into territory that can upset people. But um, oh, okay. Well, because all right, so the concept of like saying everything happens for a reason when somebody suffers a terrible loss right is never not as comforting as anybody ever thinks it is when they actually say it right yeah right <laughs> that's true but when when um but but when you think about like you know terrible things do happen and then sometimes good things happen that would not have happened if the terrible thing didn't happen in the first place yeah mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and it seems like there's that's the basics of what fate is right um Right. Fate is the never ending twists and turns. And, uh, I think largely what I'm always interested in is, is the weird stuff. Mm -hmm. And the word weird also comes from a root word, which is the same as fate. W Y R D. Weird. Right? Yep. So, so, um, it's the the fateful twists and turns that happen in everybody's life all the time that almost seem unbelievable when when you're actually confronted with the whole of it when you take a look back at your life and think about the things that had to fall into place just the way they did to um uh in order for the things you have now to have happened right yeah so the way i described it recently was um it's amazing that anything exists at all when you think about it that way yes Cause in order for in order oh, yeah. for us, yeah in order for the six of us to be sitting here having a conversation everything that has ever happened had to have happened exactly the way it happened right any yeah. deviation yeah. from that would mean that the six of us weren't sitting here talking right now which is for probably. me to be able to say that convoluted sentence <laughs> so sure <laughs> so i mean i think sometimes <laughs> yeah what if there is a retconning what if there is like an underlying support structure where there are intelligences consciousnesses mm -hmm. entities that are able to like go back in time and fix something sure mm -hmm. well i mean this is this takes me back to the the idea that valet supposes of a control system and i don't think that you you know i mean even if you just take that particular phrase, a control system, and you think about, you know, the world or the environment as a system and that, you know, as in most other things, if not almost every other thing that we observe here in nature and in stuff that is human made, there are systems of control that are put in place uh, in order to facilitate the running or the operation. It just seems like that's something that needs to happen for things to operate. Um, and, you know, I really, not that I have any idea what's going on or what it is, but I do think that there's something there that is, you know, we shouldn't look away from if we're trying to get to the bottom of, I don't know, uh, UFO phenomenon, for example, is to think about it in terms of that. Now, what it is, of course, yeah, that we got, you know, decades to not figure it out, uh, <laughs> if not centuries and eons. But yeah, because the bigger question is uh, not whether there is a control system or not, but what is its purpose? Is the purpose of the control system to keep things running as they are? 
or to try to change things in right. order to you know improve it improve right. the system right sure is it is it and it, how do we fit into the control system like exactly. are we are we you know we being you know human consciousness are we uh, is our free will something that needs to be put in check or is it, exactly. you know, something else? Yeah. 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 All right. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. And we're going to take a quick break here and, uh, I'm going to give you another recommendation again for a fictional podcast because there's a bunch of them that are really, really good. Uh, this one has finished, but of course you could still go listen to it. It's called Ars Paradoxica and it's A-R-S and Paradox I-C-A. And this thing is, uh, phenomenal. It's a very complex story. I think I ended up having listened to it twice that deals with time travel and, uh, it's good. It's really, really good. If you like time travel stuff, if you like complicated stories and, uh, well, paradoxes for that matter so check it out it's done very very well and as i said it's a complete story because it's done well worth your time if you're into that type of stuff so as i've said before if you have a story you want to share with us you can do so at stories at where did the road eventually we'll compile them into a listener story episode or if you want to come on and talk about your story same address stories at where did the road um you can mail me stuff physically at p.o box 444 ovid new york 14521 and you can find all our social media at www dot where did the road go dot com so everything is linked there and we are closing in on our 10th anniversary show coming up very soon here on where did the road go you're listening to where did the road go and i have with me uh super inframan and red pill junkie and taylor and chris ernst and ap strange yo and we left off talking about control systems yeah yeah and, and, uh, <laughs> well, I think it's helpful to think of it sort of like an ecosystem, right? Because uh, an ecosystem, yeah, an ecosystem is an example of a control system where all the different species, flora and fauna, and also atmospheric and weather conditions all have to play a part to keep things running the way they do. And if you mm -hmm. upset the order of any of that, it dramatically changes what that all looks like. Uh, yeah, so, but but there is also wiggle room. You know, I mean, like like. Uh, you know, for example, the, the specific places that some, you know, flora grow or how much or whatever. And it does, it does change the balance. Right. But, you know, thinking of like a real life example, it's the, the difference of whether I put like butter or peanut butter on my toast, right. That might not have a tremendous impact on whether or not we're sitting here having this conversation, but there's, there's an overarching kind of, um, uh, I guess, yeah, system that's at play that, that seems to be, or, or maybe is, um, pulling, pulling those threads together, I guess. I don't know if that made sense. Speaking of ecological systems and, you know, bringing back the conversation to stories of 2022, one of the bigger stories that happened this year is the death of, uh, James Lovelock, who was oh, yeah. a British scientist. Yeah, right. Who, who helped coin the term of uh, the you know, the Gaia hypothesis, which is okay. like I think now called Earth yes Earth systems Earth science systems, and this is the guy that began giving the ideas, give, putting the seed into our consciousness, the idea of, of of the Earth as a living being, you know, where where all, everything is trying to reach some sort of equilibrium and and speaking of jeremy Bainey, he recently had uh, a friend of mine book who is uh he lives in serbia you guys he, what he was on here wasn't he uh, he, he also he was so. on yeah, here, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. absolutely like, oh and and he's very big on on the gaia hypothesis hypothesis and how it is related with what we call the paranormal and i think it, it, there is a lot of things yeah. that that they can be talked about that you know there are a lot of people who see that uh, you know the idea of the trickster being part of that control system to try to keep uh, uh, some kind of like equilibrium when you know society is run stagnant and it's time to like kick them in the butt <laughs> yeah. in order to try to elicit uh, positive change or at least some kind of change out of stagnation so yeah yeah, so the Gaia, the Gaia hypothesis is think definitely one of the the most uh, popular and most important scientific theories of the 20th century. Yeah, it, it's a very interesting theory, and I am a fan of some of those concepts of you know the the whole Earth as being this kind of living system, right? Yeah, that's a uh, that's cool stuff. Also, uh, Vuk has um, a podcast called Tracing Owls. 
I I yes. just recently started listening to it. It's, it's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, Red Pill and I were both on there, I think, right? Were yes. you on there? Yes, yeah. I am. And, and I am number one. In the, in the, in the, <laughs> nice, nice. As of today. Oh, yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, you know, I've got to be on there at some point. He asked me a while back, and I, I haven't had time. So I now my goal is to lap red pill. I don't think it's going to happen, exactly. but I'm going to try. Yeah. yeah. Good luck. <laughs> so what, what other documentaries have come out this year? Well, one of the most important documentaries with regards to the UFO phenomenon was Aerial Phenomenon. Mm, yeah. Oh, I heard good things. What is that? Brad Nickerson? Is that the director? Nick Nick Nickerson? I believe so. I, I don't have that uh, in front of me right now. But Yeah, uh, I haven't seen it yet, but I've, I've heard a couple interviews with him. And I oh, think, you I've haven't been, yet? Well, it's, Yeah, I've been, I've been uh, track tracing it since, God, it must have been the aughts when he started. He'd been working on it for like 10, 15 years. No, it's on my, I just, I now probably just today have time to do things finally again. So I'm it's gonna, now all in all major streaming platforms. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna rent it over the next couple of days. And what highly, is highly what is it about? Yeah, about the aerial UFO case that I think happened in 1994. It's in some, yeah, it's in Zimbabwe. Oh, okay. Zimbabwe. Aerial yeah. School. Okay. Yeah. Do- dozens of children who saw what seemed to have been some kind of like object that landed or or uh, hovered near their school ground and they also observed entities near this object and some of the kids also had what seems to be uh, what what we, we we could only describe as telepathic communication yeah. with the entities that seem to have highly ecological undertones getting back yeah. to the idea of gaia these kids had the idea that we were killing the earth yeah. that we need to stop uh like uh, regarding so much on technology uh, in, in order to save our planet. And obviously these kids were like six years old, 12 years old when that happened. Now these kids are adults and the documentary follows some of them and interview them and trying to like answer the question of how, what happens with a person that is carrying the weight of this uh, experience throughout their, their adult life, you know, and, and obviously a, a lot of them, for a lot of them, it wasn't easy. Like one of the girls that was interviewed, like very candidly said that she's never discussed the experience with her husband. Like imagine that it's, it's kind of like equating the, the, the UFO experience with uh, being raped when you were a kid, you know, like something like you cannot even talk to the, the people closer to you in your, in your, in your life. And I, I found it fascinating, you know, that uh, to be honest, I, uh, even very emotional at times. And I don't know that the, the, it also I like the idea that it didn't really rely on the ETH angle in order to tell the story. Like it wasn't really that important, like trying to convince the viewer that, oh, yes, this kid saw um, like an extraterrestrial spacecraft that landed on Earth and they, you know, contacted ETs. That's really not what it's about. It's about the human aspect of the contact experience, which to me is yeah. really the most important thing of this whole thing. Yes. Right. Yeah. We did do a yeah. show on that at one point. Uh, mm-hmm. Jeff Fritzman wanted to do it. So it was me, Jeff, and I want to say Joshua Kutchin, but I'm not sure. Mm. Yeah, that's, that could be certainly a very traumatic. I mean, any any you know close encounter uh, could be a very traumatic incident. Mm-hmm. It's a really interesting case. And John Mack was, uh, you know, before he passed, was or before he was killed um uh I, I don't mean that in any nefarious way but he was struck by a car um yes. yeah he was working on this uh prior to his death too mm-hmm. yeah hmm. um well although it didn't technically come out chris did a documentary on where did the road go i did and it really will be out like i said i mean we're we're on schedule i'm got to finish up some of the stuff this week so we'll have it Probably next month, maybe end of next month, um, before nice. I start my next semester, uh, and hopefully everybody will be able to see that. I got to look. I got to provide. Uh, I got to provide Soraya with some, I guess, a couple of pickup lines to introduce some of the sections. And you did air uh, it at, at Strange Realities, and that I did air it at Strange Realities. That yeah. whole thing so, with the Q and A is available in the Patreon section of yep. Where Did the Road Go. 
So if anyone yep. wants an early, see an early version of it, it's there. Yeah, yeah, it'll be uh, you know slightly different. Um, uh, does, mainly does it have a title movie. yet? Yeah, it's called Magicians Long to See. Mm. Oh, I like that. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Got to fit in a Twin Peaks reference. I, of course, I got to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of uh, things that that came out in 2022, as far as like um, documentaries or movies. Uh, has anybody here seen the movie Nope by Jordan yes. Peele? Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh yeah. yeah. Good to bring that up. I, I, no, I that, very much enjoyed it. it I just good finally good. watched it. It was uh, it was incredible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's, go ahead, Taylor. Oh, yeah. I was just going to describe it for anybody who yeah, hasn't seen Spo- it. So spoiler it, free. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's uh, it's a movie that, you know, from the trailer, um, it appears to be about sort of a, a um, town in, in the southwest, I think in California. Um, and these, uh, these two people who are, um, essentially like, uh, horse ranchers and, um, they begin to have some kind of UFO experiences and it, uh, it goes in some very, very interesting directions. It's a, it's a cool take on the UFO phenomena. Um, I was pleasantly surprised with where they went with it. I didn't know if I would be, but I was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I would say, you know, at least, um, parts of it definitely strike me as like leaning into the horror genre, but you know, there's certainly a lot more to it than that. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it, it, much like a lot of Jordan Peele's movies. It, it really is kind of a blend of different things, different genres and, and, um, mm-hmm. sort of feels like a, a very unique and cohesive piece. Um, so I definitely recommend anybody and, out there who's interested, watch it. And once you've watched it, go read the trivia on IMDb because oh. there's a lot of really interesting things hidden in that movie. Oh, okay. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Like timing of when things happen and stuff like that. Uh, he, he hid a lot of stuff in there. You wouldn't think to look for. Yeah. There are a lot of reference to old, uh, contactees from the 1950s. Huh? Okay. Sprinkle oh. there in here and there that I noticed, but also, I mean, to me, the one of the most interesting things about the movie is, uh, aside from some interesting correlations to the infamous Skinwalker Ranch in Utah, uh, the idea about uh, evidence, trying to get gather evidence about something mm. paranormal, but what are you, what are you seeking? To you to use the evidence for you know I mean in the case of uh, of the movie and I guess it's a mild spoiler that you know is the idea is get the evidence of something paranormal in order to cash in you know yeah. in order yep. to, yeah, yeah. To, to profit from it economically uh, and there are other characters in the, in the movie for which it seems to be something more primordial or something more existential. The idea of getting that evidence of, of, of something really wonderful and, and, and mysterious in the, in the world. But yeah, I mean, it, it, it really raises the question uh, that, you know, ufologists sh- should make themselves more frequently. Okay. Why are you struggling so much to try to prove the existence of UFOs? What is it you, that you're trying to achieve? Really? Yeah. Yeah. And I love that motivation That's too. That's a really good point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just so well done. It's so funny. <laughs> mm-hmm. And and to me, it comes down to why, why are people wasting their time trying to prove something that clearly exists, which is the, these right. unusual phenomena uh, to people who clearly are never going to care. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel like there's more of a contingent these days of people just not needing uh, that confirmation? You know, we talked earlier about, you know, disclosure coming one day, you know, and people that always think it's like just around the corner. But, you know, for the people that uh, have just accepted, like, it's not coming. Does that seem like that's grown more or does it still seem like it's a small pocket. So I don't want to, I don't want to get political at all, but broadly, I, I think that there are some parallels with that idea of, um, that attitude shifting and also, um, the way that, uh, the way that people consume like news media has shifted into, um, kind of just, I think, I think probably Saxon, I think there's a lot of people who, um, find their niche and don't worry as much about wanting to, um, have it proved to them so mm-hmm. much as they're just going to believe it because they've had a personal experience or they've become somehow convinced through, you know, emotional means or, or whatever. I think that applies to, you know, the, the, the anomalous as well as, um, real life, you know, or quote unquote, right. Like 
you know, everyday public sphere kind of interactions. Right, right. I hadn't thought about that correlation. That makes a lot of sense. Mm. Um, yeah. I mean, it comes down to like, do you want proof or disclosure or an authoritative voice validating what you already believe? Right. right? Yep. Mm-hmm. And if I'm if I'm going to appeal to any authority for what or is or is not true, I'm not really not sure the U.S. government is at the top of my list. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> It's the same government that couldn't verify my identity when I tried to file for taxes a couple of years ago, which <laughs> lost. <laughs> okay, so what kind of authority will suit your needs or, or will suit your expectations? Um, I I don't think I really need one. I, I don't yeah. think I, I don't re, I don't personally yeah. require the validation myself. Sure, yeah. but if there was you know someone or some some institution that you know tomorrow will say you know. Uh, we have confirmation that uh, UFOs exist and they are not, uh, you know, man-made or natural phenomena. What will be the ideal? Well, that's what that's what I'm wondering. Is like, where is that threshold for disclosure? Where where has that been moved to? Where have we moved the goalpost to? Because I mean, it seems like some people won't be happy until they hear from the White House itself that we have a flying saucer in a hangar somewhere right. that was recovered and reverse sure. engineered. You know, uh, they won't be happy then either. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Right. Does it have to be the Pope? Does it have to be the United Nations? Or is there no, you know, I mean, I can think, you know, both of those circumstances would have a lot of people rejecting it as false narrative. Well, right, sure. because the disclosure advocates can't even really sm- celebrate the small victories because, you know, some reports will come out and and they'll say that, uh, oh, well, I mean, hey, the government just said that, that UFOs are real and nobody cares. Nobody's talking about it. Yeah. It's just like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, getting back to the idea of, uh, uh, we talked about John Mack and, and talking about another Harvard scientist on a personal crusade, there is uh, Abby Loeb, you know, mm-hmm. the astrophysicist who became prominent because of his uh, theory that uh, Oumuamua was some kind of like interstellar object of, uh, you know, of intelligent design that uh, visited our solar system. And now one of the another one of the 22, 22 uh, stories is that he, with his uh, Galileo project, now their main purpose is to try to go to Papua New Guinea, uh, try to retrieve this uh, uh, meteorite or this object that fell into the, uh, I guess it's the Indian Ocean or the Pacific Ocean, uh, that it is of uh, uh, extrasolar origin. And Lowell, for some reason, thinks that there is a good chance it might be uh, an extraterrestrial probe that crashed on Earth. Uh, but even if they manage to retrieve it, and even if they manage to prove that it is artificial, uh, I'm sure that a lot of people, you know, most 99% of the scientific community will disregard it, you know, they, they will refute it. And this will be a controversy for probably decades. Why does yeah. he think it's a probe? Uh, he thinks that uh, there's a good, I don't know, really, it's a good question. Uh, maybe <laughs> the way that it uh, crashed, I don't know, the velocity or the, the trajectory of the of the object after it uh, entered that, our atmosphere. Mm. But uh, and, and also the composition, I think that is uh, uh, too dense, you know, to, in, 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 in its uh, volume to be just a uh, simple rock. Gotcha. Interesting. Okay. Mm. All right. Well, we are just about out of time. Um, <laughs> well, we didn't even cover half of the, the list that I compiled. <laughs> Lightning <laughs> round. Another, yeah, another round. So uh, let's go around, though. Uh, Taylor, where can people find you? Um, right now, uh, Sigil Arcanum Tarot and uh, Green Line Podcast. And I'm starting a gaming podcast. So if anybody out there is interested, Stories and Lies. Um, it's going to be launching probably when this comes out. Okay. Uh, Super nice. Inframan. Yeah, you know, I am on Instagram and Mastodon under Super Inframan. And I always know Saxon Williams in my bio. So. Those are the places I hang out these days. Discord as well? Discord as well, yeah. Chris? Uh, you, if you want to see the stuff I do, I uh, can go to brightrectangle.com 
dot com and that'll take you the links where you can watch stuff i do and otherwise uh you know i'll be here uh uh hopefully a little bit more because uh i'm done with my semester nice <laughs> um red pill well i'm still on twitter we'll try and to destroy the site from within <laughs> <laughs> and make uh, elon musk poor or bankrupt or, or, or crazy you uh, uh, and you can find me also at the daily grail uh dailygrail.com and also at my personal website absurdbydesign.com okay and ap um you can find my weird writings at apstrange.com um i've also lately been writing for paranormality magazine so um and that's a print, find some of, print magazine it is print but you can get a digital subscription to or you can purchase issues digitally or in print um either way on the on the website but i have a few up there that are online only um and we'll be producing more of those Okay. Uh, also sticking around on Twitter till the bitter end. Uh, <laughs> it's been getting pretty pretty grim over there, but um, it's been worth worth it for the memes that it, people have just been merciless towards old musky there. Um, <laughs> and I, so also I've been using Instagram and Mastodon a little bit more, so you can find me on those platforms. All right. Well, I thank you all. This has been great. Thank you. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank thanks. You. Thank you. Happy New Year. Feliz Año Nuevo. I'd like to take a moment here to thank all of my Patreons, because without you, this show would not be what it is. And I want to give a special shout out to those of you pledging $10 or more. Allison Cook, Super Inframan, 36 Dingo, Chuck Shutters, Leanne Cherry, CJ, Tim, Andrew Nichols, Matthew Sproul, Christine, a blue second gen MR2 drifting around a Japanese mountain. Patricia Gaiaquinta, Alex Whitcomb, American Rambler, Andrew Maines, Ann Witowski, Barbara Fisher, Beverly Williamson, Big Boy Lemina, Charles Davis, Charles in Florida, Land of the Crazy and Communicable, Christopher Ernst, Craig Cicernos, Bill Luminati, Craig Parmenter, Diane B., Empty K., Eric Todd, J., James Lattimore, James Lindsay, Jim Pyre, John Bracken, Carla Mahoney, Kevin, Kevin Shrek, Cool Kitty, Kristen L., Laser Printer Jam, Seed Person 1, Lauren McLean, Linz Jackson K., Luke Osborne, MJ Armstrong, Jim and Sophie, Mark Brady, Matt in Delaware, Oli Andre Olar, Patricia W., Paul Jeffries, Philosopher of Mirrors, Ray Benedetto, Riker and Stark, Ron Dupre, Sam Sharon, Stacey Sherwood, Tactical Therapist, Taylor Bell, Thunderboy, Tyler Glimstead, Veroche K, Vincent Trewell, Walker, Will Gebhard, Will Powell, Ren Collier, Stephen D, Amber Hall, and Craig Sagastumi. I thank all of you for the incredible support. So we will be continuing this next week in a part two of our mega roundtable show here, end of the year roundup, as we only got through about half of what Red Pill had pulled out for us to talk about. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, more or less the same lineup. Next week, there's no Patreon segment for this one, but I do have some Patreon stuff I'm going to put up. And uh, it's the end of the year, so at the end of the year, Patreons uh, get sort of uh, something extra as well. So if you're a patron, that'll be coming soon. Uh, If you want to become a patron, it's only $3 a month. You get the shows a week early. You get extra content on almost every show, plus some special stuff mixed in there as well. And I want to give a shout out to two of my new patrons this week, AJ Schlechten and David McCourt. Thank you and all my patrons for helping support this show. And I will see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons. And we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support. <laughs>